This will be the 12th message in our series on the table of the Lord. Now the table of the Lord is a unique place. It's a place of fellowship or communion. It's a place of self-examination. It's a place of blessing. And it can be a place of judgment as well. All of this centers in something we do <clears throat> that's within a covenant that's not based on doing. Now you want to ponder that. At this table, faith reaches back to the death of Christ and obtains the power of it. It reaches forward to the coming of Christ and obtains the power of a living hope. Yeah. Amen. So as you stand here at this table, you're reaching, you're embracing the totality of the new covenant, Amen. the basis and the destiny. Here you've got it at this table here. Now tonight our subject is the table, one of two ordinances left of the church. This is an essential subject, but it's not a simplistic one. Our text, in our text Paul told him to remember in all things and keep the ordinances that I deliver unto you. Now the word ordinances as, as used here has a lexical or dictionary definition but it's, it's not appropriate for a scripture. It's something that's passed along by word. Yeah, that's not what it means here. Even though that's definition of the Greek word. I'm going to say that there wasn't really an English word that adequately stated what he was talking about here. I'm going to define it by how the law defined ordinances. Ordinance was a procedure, an outward procedure that was set in motion. Something you did outwardly. Something it involved your body. Now under the law there were ordinances and laws. <clears throat> things you did, things you embraced with your mind. Two, two, different, two different things. Under the law, for instance, Exodus 18.20, Thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws. That's the ordinances and laws, and shall show them the way wherein they must walk, and the work that they must do. I right, see under the law, there were things you had to do. Some people think that in Christ there aren't things you have to do, but there are. Two essential things, I would not go so far as to say that the only things that we have to do but they stand unique as pillars of understanding and involvement. Hebrews 9, 1 reminds us the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service. That you had to do certain things and do them a certain way. And particularly the priest, they had to do certain things at certain times in a certain manner. That's, that's what an ordinance involved. <clears throat> Hebrews 9.10 says that the first covenant stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings, washings and carnal ordinances. Carnal ordinances imposed. 
I tell you now, God has a right to impose. Amen. Impose until the time of Reformation. There's certain things they had to do until the time came when their nature would be re recreated to do what was good and acceptable in the eyes of the Lord. Carnal ordinances were external, bodily ordinances, things they had to do. There were, for instance, as a further example, the Passover had ordinances, things you had to do. Very them. Numbers 9, 12. They shall leave none of it, that's the Passover lamb, they shall eat none of it unto the morning and break any bone of it according to all the ordinances of the Passover. So you had to, you had to go about the Passover exactly like God said to do it. And there are still things that you have to do exactly like God said to do it. Amen. We don't have a lot of them like Cardinal Lord that the, like the law had. But we do have some. And men don't have the option now mm -hmm. to decide how they're going to do this. Amen. There's a way in which it has to be done. The law also was said to could be contained in ordinances. That's Ephesians 2.15. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the commandments contained in ordinances. So the, the commandment, you summarize the first table, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Summarize the second table, love your neighbor as yourself. But those two commandments were contained I mean, he told you how to love God. Yeah. Bring the tithes into the storehouse. Mm -hmm. Keep the feasts. Be mindful of your neighbor. Set your landmarks right. See, it was ordinances, external things they had to do. When I call for a feast, there will a man go. Leave and go to it. Contained in ordinances. In other words, under the, under the old covenant... God dictated how they fulfill the Ten Commandments. It wasn't left up to everybody just to figure out what thou shalt love the Lord thy God meant. It, he told them how to do it. Uh -huh. Don't make a graven image. Don't bow down to a graven image. Don't take the name of the Lord in vain. Don't talk about God. If you're unrelated to him and you're not devoted to him, don't even talk about him. Don't take his day. See, he told them precisely how to how to go about it. Now there's still there are, there's still some professed Christian groups that still approach living for God this way. This was the way of the old covenant. There is such a thing, Paul said, as man-made ordinances, as ordinances of man, procedures, rites, R I T E S ceremonies that men concoct and bind upon others. Colossians 2.20 says, If ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are you subject to ordinances? So just exactly why do you observe 40 days of purpose? Why do you have a prayer altar? Hmm? Why do you teach people that at the Lord's table you receive forgiveness of sins because you ate it? Why do you do this? This is what Paul would ask in our day. See, anytime men say this is what you have, if you come here, this is what you have to do. Well, it's, if it's what God said to do, that's, that's good. But it better not be an ordinance of man. See, God's particular about concocting things that profess to have the answer to the human dilemma, like 12 steps on how to overcome alcohol, or eight steps, or what steps on how to manage anger. 
steps on how to win souls, steps on how to start churches. Oh, they're all over the place. When we talk about ordinances, this is not, this is not the manner of the new covenant. There are, in my understanding, two of these type of things, things you do outwardly that you have no option at all in whether you do it or how you do it. And out there, baptism and the Lord's Supper, they're both ordinances. Outward involvements of the body, something that has to be done. So let's look, for, let's look first at baptism. Baptism is called, in Romans 6, 17, a form of the doctrine. That is to say, it's an outward display of the doctrine. God has taken the doctrine and he's portrayed it in a form. In baptism, the form, the doctrine is the death, burial, Resurrection of Christ, that's the doctrine. The form is buried with Christ, dead with Christ, buried with Christ, raised with Christ. See, that's, and it's in a bodily form. The form isn't sprinkling water. That's not the form. Form isn't pouring water. That's not the form. The form is down into the water, up out of the water. See, the form has to agree with the doctrine. Amen. God doesn't sprinkle life on you. He doesn't sprinkle his spirit on you. you. Say, what about he pours it? Well, yeah, he pours it like a waterfall pour. So the person is completely inundated in it. Romans 6, 3, Paul reasons about this. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ is raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So we, this is a good point of reason. You say, person says, well, I've been baptized. That's good, we think. Now, what we need to know is if you've been raised to walk in newness of life, because that's, that's what the ordinance is. Yeah. The ordinance involves a form, but the form projects what actually is taking place within the person. When a person is baptized, there's a crucifixion that takes place, which is pivotal in the doctrine of Christ. Crucifixion is pivotal. In the doctrine of Christ, the cross was the means by which everything was provided for mankind. So I read in Romans 6, 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So now the doctrine, the doctrine is Christ died. He died by crucifixion. It was a slow, it was a process. It was a death process process. When you are baptized, your old man is crucified and a death process commences. And the objective is that the, that old man will finally expire. Mm -hmm. That the body of sin might be destroyed. So the, doc, the, the ordinance perfectly matches the doctrine. But if, if there is a kind of baptism introduced where the old man is not crucified and we're not buried, buried into Christ's death and not raised, then the, the, the ordinance is an ordinance of men. It's not an ordinance of God. The ordinance has got to match the doctrine. It's got to do this. Romans 6, 7, and this whole sixth chapter, of course, about baptism. Romans 6, 7 refers to the ordinance <clears throat> He that is dead is freed from sin. Mm -hmm. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death has no more dominion over him. Amen. All right, now the form, the ordinance, has to agree with the doctrine. If a person is baptized with the Christ, with Christ, it is expected that death and sin will not have dominion over them anymore. Amen. 
And if it does, then that wasn't the ordinance that God ordained. Yes, whatever happened at that occasion that they call baptism, whatever happened, if it didn't result in what we're talking about here, that wasn't God's ordinance. That's not what he put in motion. Amen. He put in motion a form of the doctrine that resulted in the crucifixion of the old man, raising to walk in newness of life, and not death not having dominion anymore, and being liberated from the tyranny and control of sin. And if that didn't happen, it was an ordinance of men, or the person was totally insincere and did not have a true heart. Romans 6.12, let's take this a little bit further. I'm showing again that the ordinance contained the doctrine. Just like the laws, just like the ordinances of the law contained the law, see? The ordinance contained the doctrine. This is Romans 6.12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. Why? Because in the doctrine, what the in the form, what the doctrine taught was embodied or contained in the form. If your heart, if you obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine delivered to you, God did what he said he was going to do with people that died and were raised with Christ. In such a case, sin does not have dominion over the individual. This has got to be told them. To say it another way, they can say no, they've been liberated from the dominion of sin. And again, a little one further thing in Romans 6.16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are, to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Being then made free from sin. Remember, this is he's pointing to an ordinance, something you did with your body outwardly, but something happened that God promised in the new covenant, when that took place, God did something. Amen. Being made free, being made free from sin, ye became servants of righteousness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. So here's an ordinance. It's remarkable, brethren. Here's an ordinance that is actually a line of demarcation between old life and new life. Amen. That's what an ordinance ordinance contains the truth that it portrays. Yeah. So you see that if you would choose a form that doesn't match the doctrine, you're, you're, you're off base, you're off kilter right away. Yeah. People will say, well, there's various forms of baptism. No, there are not various forms of baptism. Baptism is the form. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That's right. There's not forms of baptism. Baptism is the form. Why is it the form? Because it is structured by God to contain the doctrine. Right, that's what an ordinance is. Baptism is the first. It's at the threshold. Coming into Christ, this is, this is what has to be done. You have to go down with Jesus and come up with Jesus. And if you don't, you didn't follow the form. You didn't follow the ordinance. Now the, the second, of course, is the Lord's table. The doctrine is summarized in this table. You've got to be able to see it, but it is there. Several of the brethren had developed this at length. But the Tony developed some excellent aspects of it today. But the reason he's able to do it, and the reason the rest of you brethren can draw parallels here, is because the form contains, the ordinance contains the doctrine. That's right. He's here at the table. Now the doctrine is summarized in the table. You cannot drink. Now he's going to talk about salvation, new covenant, relationship with God. He's going to go to summarize it in the table. 
1 Corinthians 10, 21. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord in the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and table of devils. Look how much is said. Look how much is said here. Yeah, yeah. There are lots happening at this table here. We're just not going through a routine or a ritual. That's not what's happening here. Any more than you're going through a ritual if you follow the lust of the flesh and obey Satan. You don't obey Satan by ritual, do you? You enter into the thing heartily. This, so this table, eating of this table properly is equated with partaking of what the, the feast God's prepared. Amen. It's embodied right here. This isn't the only place we understand this, but this is like this is like Sinai was to the law. This is like the high mountain here. When you're at this table, oh, it's marvelous to consider. Amen. And when I think about how people are diminishing the presence of the table and relegating it yeah. to the back of the auditorium and, and this sort of thing, I <laughs> they can't be preaching the doctrine or they couldn't do this. Yeah, that's right. Why, whatever they're preaching is way off kilter because if there's not place made for this table, something's wrong with the message. Because uh -huh. this is the embodiment of the message. Here it is. First Corinthians eleven twenty four. <laughs> when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, "Take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me." Well, that is remarkable. And at this table, this is my body. He didn't say this looks like my body. This is an emblem of my body. It's a symbol of my body. He didn't say that. That's right. This is my body. How could he? He wasn't talking about the. Constitu chemical constitution yeah. of the bread. That's not what he's talking. He's talking about the doctrinal constitution of the ordinance. Yeah. That's what he's talking about. That the truth has been poured into this ordinance. So when you go through this rather simplistic act of eating the bread, you do it by faith now, and your memory recalls Christ to mind. In that process, God ministers life to you. Yeah. Oh, it's Marvelous, marvelous for its complexity. Do this in remembrance of me. That's your part. Remember me. The ministration of life, that's God's part. But he does it in the ordinance. That's right. Do a person says, well, I'm very busy today. Yeah. I got a lot to do this afternoon. And so I'm going to have to leave early. I, well, what do you think? God's going to minister to you outside the ordinance? Is this what, does a person think? Is there a person that imagines that God will take what he has invested in this ordinance and give it to you independently of the ordinance? Does someone think God's going to do this after he went through or what all was involved to establish the ordinance? Then does he like place it aside and ha let you sit at his table? Even though you don't participate in the ordinance, well, the very thought is just foolishness. Right. You say, well, that's too legalistic. So be it. Yeah. Amen. So be it. That's the way God is. When God establishes ordinances, it's so that they be kept. He demonstrated it under the law. He, he said, tell them the ordinances and the laws. Tell them, tell them what they're to do. Yeah. He's told us what to do. This do. Is that what it said? Mm -hmm. This do. When the day of Pentecost, he said, what shall we do? Right. So he told them, repent and be baptized. That was something that had to be done. Not something that was done to them, something they did. Yeah. Yeah. But, it, but it, in, in, it, in the doing of it, the power of the ordinance, this ordinance was administered. Colossians 1, 21 and 22. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body. He said, this is my body. Mm -hmm. In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. This is my body, all right? Remember this, what he said about his body. He reconciles you in his body. That's what it says. So in his body. And he's going to present you through his body unblameable in his sight. 
Now then, Jesus takes that whole mass of truth and he deposits it, so to speak, in the bread. Yes. Amen. <laughs> and so when you partake of it, you're actually obtaining what he promised here. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much more he could simplify the matter. Mm -hmm. A faith it is it. I'm, this all mm -hmm. postulates the presence of faith and persuasion and this sort of thing. This is all postulated in it. But how how... How much more practical could he get to that? Mm -hmm. No wonder the early church break bread from house to house and continued steadfastly. They, they, in some sense, they saw this. And if something that happens at this table, it doesn't happen every, every place else. Yes. In fact, I don't know if it happens any place else than it does at this very table. And you know, when you read about Jesus' institution of the table and all the gospel writers have something to say about it, you're stricken with the sobriety of the moment. How he got their attention, he spoke why he spoke about things he never spoke before, about the nature of the covenant. Now here's another, now remember, remember his body, his body. Colossians 2.9 says, In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. See, there it is. So this... When we, we remember his body, we're remembering his body, the fullness of the God held dwelt in him bodily. That is, his body was a container for God's fullness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the bread is a container of that doctrine, Amen. which has all, it means that there are things accessible to you. When you sit at this table, there are things accessible unto you that go far beyond your fondest imagination. So we have meditations. We people think of this from from different angles because we we see this is a big, this is a big thing here. And so for years we'll talk about it every Lord's Day. Different men will come out from different angles. Fresh views will be given. Why? Because it's, it's that large. Yeah. It's that big. Amen. Body. This body. Remember body. Hebrews ten five. When he cometh into the world. He saith, the word coming in the world. He said, sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not. So I know, Father, that you don't, you're not calling for more lambs and more he goats and more heifers and more <laughs> red heifers and more bulls. You're not asking for more sacrifices like that. That isn't what you want. But a body, a body, a body. You prepared me in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then, in the full awareness of that, I said, Lo, I come in the volume of the book is written to me to do thy will. Above when he says, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offering and offering for sin thou wouldst not, neither has pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that's the first covenant. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. That's a new covenant. By which will, and covenant is a will. Not talking about will like the will of God. We're talking about the will as the will and testament. Mm -hmm. By which will we are sanctified by the offering of the body. There it is again. Of Jesus Christ once for all. All right. Now, Roman Catholicism teaches, dogmatically so, that at this table, which they called the Mass, Jesus is sacrificed again and again and again. That's not what he means. He was sacrificed once. Amen. And all that God required was accomplished when he's in that body. Mm -hmm. And all that God was offering was made available when that body was raised from the dead. So there's no excuse for anybody being short when it comes to the things of God. If anyone not obtaining or anyone remaining juvenile or anyone remaining a novice or anyone not growing in grace and truth because it's all made accessible in the body of Christ 
which is what we remember at this table, and it's how we look at the bread. This is my body. Amen. Not chemically my body, spiritually, what my body, the significance of my body is transferred to you at this time. And it's a covenant of participation that's depicted in the cup. 1 Corinthians 10, 16 the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion or fellowship or participation of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we be many are one bread and one body, and we all are partakers of that one bread. <laughs> That's remarkable. The cup of blessing, it's the communion. We make, this is a clumsy way to say it, contact with the blood. That's not really, I don't like that type of language. But the efficacy or effectiveness of the blood of Christ is obtained Amen. at this time. If you, if you feel a sense of need of cleansing, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Or if you sense a need of being near to God and the blood of Christ made us nigh. <laughs> Or if you sense the need of being united with God's people, the, the, blood of, the blood of Christ was the means by which he broke down the middle wall or partition. And you feel like you need to come to God more than we draw near by the blood. Mm -hmm. It's all that can happen here at this table. It can actually take place. Yeah. Why? Because it's an, or, it's an ordinance. Yeah. Uh -huh. The ordinance contains... The doctrine, and the doctrine is effective. It's a true, effective doctrine. So that if you see it, if it clears up to you, you begin to participate in it, and all of the benefits you begin to realize from it. This is why Paul, the writer of Hebrews said, Hebrews 13.10, We have an altar, whereof they that have no right to eat would serve the tabernacle. It's an altar we eat at. This is a... This is an eating altar. The priests of old, they used to eat part of what was offered on the altar. All right, so we have an altar. It's the table here is what it is. He just prepared a table in the wilderness for us, and he's serving up salvation and participation and realization of what he promised. He's serving it up at this table, and it can become so real to you, it'll... it'll compel you through the rest of the rest of the week. That's how we meet on the first day of the week. Mm -hmm. See, the Sabbath, that's the way you ended the week. Mm -hmm. The first day of the week is where you start the week. Mm -hmm. And and you obtain all this strength. He just said, as often as ye, Paul said, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Show or declare. Some say declare or proclaim. It's not like we're announcing to the rest of the world, Jesus died. I mean, that's, it's, it goes deeper than that. We're like proclaiming it to God. Yeah. We're blessing God. Mm -hmm. We're saying, I see this, Father. Yeah. I see what you did. I see what you did. And I want to live in the power of this. And so we show his death. We show our participation in it. We show our awareness of it, our cognizance of it, and then the power of it is given to us. And this covenant is a covenant of Christ-centeredness. That's what we remember. We remember him. Remember, remember me. Two times he says it, once in relation to the bread, once in relation to the cup. Remember me. And remember, the covenant was ratified by the blood of Christ. This is the blood of the New Testament, he said, as he took the cup. Now, this, uh, in this covenant, there's a unity achieved as we eat this bread, drink this cup. There's a unity that happens that can't be duplicated. 1 Corinthians 10, 17, we being many are one bread. 
and one body. We're like a loaf of uncut bread. For, or this is why, this is why we're one bread. Because we're partakers of that one bread. See, that's, that's what made us one. And Jesus said, I'm the bread. I'm the bread that came down from heaven. Though you partake of it here, your brethren partake of it here, and we're, we're forged into one loaf ourselves. We become bread ourselves. It's secondary to the main loaf, mm -hmm. but we become one bread. Amen. So in this table, we have an ordinance. An action, something you do associated with the covenant that's not based on what you do. <laughs> Is that marvelous? Yeah. So let no man, of course, despise this table or treat it lightly or not participate in it. Let no one who ministers at this table do so lightly or hastily or without thought because you're you're leading us in a kingdom exercise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Only God can put that much truth into an activity. Mm -hmm. Only God can do that. But he has done it. Amen. And then he, he gives us the privilege of doing it. So he can transmit all of this while we are acutely conscious of his son. Mm -hmm. Then the, it's like the gates are opened and begins to flood in. I'll leave that with you to ponder. Brother Robert has our exhortation.